good afternoon and welcome back to the National Government Ethics Virtual Summit. Uh, this is our final presentation in our virtual only sessions. We do want to remind you to join us tomorrow for the final day of the summit, Forum Day 3, which will begin at 10 a.m. tomorrow. We have a lot of interesting stakeholders from outside of the executive branch who will be joining us and we do think you'll find that to be very interesting. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it, so we'll hope you, you will join us. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Monica Asher. Welcome, Monica. Hi, thank you. And Monica has been with OGE for about two years, and before that you were the ADAO at the National Endowment for the Arts? That's correct. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad you could join us today, and you're going to be talking about ethics authority specific to non-career employees. Yes. Uh, so we're very grateful that uh, that you'll be joining us for that because this is a topic that I think is oft forgotten. It's easy to forget that these rules exist, especially if we have non-career employees that we don't talk to very often. That's correct. And I had initially presented this session at the Small Agency Invitational Day. Um, I had developed it with the part-time ethics official in mind because, as Patrick was saying, I used to be the ADAO at the NEA, um, but I was also the FOIA officer, and I had a lot of uh, a lot of different areas of law that I had to know. Um, and to give you a, a little bit of background on how this session in particular came about, um, I want to go back a, a few years to when I was a relatively new ethics official. Um, I was asked to look into the outside activities request of one of our non-career SCS officials back at my former agency. Um, he was seeking to serve on the board of a for-profit organization. Um, now that agency uh, gives grants to non-profit organizations, so membership on non-profit boards can be problematic. Um, but remember, this question pertained to the board of a for-profit. Um, so I picked up my regs and I methodically started going through the outside activities uh, section. And I get to 5 CFR 2635.801D, which is now on page 613, um, which basically states that an outside activity must comply with applicable statutes and regulations, and then proceeds to list some of the more likely candidates. And at the very end, the very end of this list of statutes and regulations, I find the following. Limitations on outside employment, 5 U.S.C. App, Ethics and Government Act of 1978, which prohibit a covered non-career employee's receipt of compensation for specified activities and provide that he shall not allow his name to be used by any firm or other entity which provides professional services involving a fiduciary relationship. Implementing regulations are contained in sections 2636.305, through 2636.307 of this chapter. And being new to ethics at the time, I remember thinking, 2636, I, I know 2635, but I, I am not familiar with 2636, and then I, I, I flipped to 2636, and I was just completely surprised at how much was there uh, that was just not familiar to me at all. Yeah, Monica, I think that's an experience that a lot of our, uh, our viewers have probably shared before. I know there are some times that I've been working through an issue and been surprised or been surprised that I forgot about 2630. Yeah. And I think it's because it doesn't come up very often. It, yeah. It's just difficult to keep in mind, especially if you're not counseling non-career folks all the time. That's correct. Um, and again, having been a part-time ethics official, um, there are so many areas of law that you need to know about, and so you, you get very familiar with 2635, for example, um, and then you get to a question that comes from this very small subset of your employees, uh, your non-career employees, and it's easy to forget that there are other areas of law uh, or other provisions of ethics law that apply to them, too. Um, now, it's, it's interesting because when I started putting this presentation together, I didn't quite realize how big the scope was. Um, and we only have an hour here today, so I'm yeah, going to have to... I'm actually very much uh, looking forward to seeing how you cover all of this in an hour. Yes, well, let me, let me tell you. I'm going to lay out the roadmap here. So I'm only going to go into depth on, on a few topics, uh, namely what we mean by certain types of non-career employees. Um, I'm also going to be covering 2636 and certain 
provisions of the teaching, speaking, and writing regulations that apply to your covered non-careers. Um, I'm also going to be touching on the ethics pledge a little bit, but more so that uh, you can recognize issues when they arise. Um, I'm also going to be giving you citations for OGE legal advisories that deal with specific provisions of the ethics pledge. So we're going to try and be complete, if not comprehensive. That's correct. Okay, um, very good. Uh, what I am going to be leaving out, however, is the 278 filing requirement um, and any Stock Act requirements uh, that are triggered by the 278 filing requirement, um, because you will have um, some career employees that uh, are 278 filers as well. Uh, so that is how we are going to fit everything into one hour. Excellent. Uh, well, should we uh, cut back to the slides yeah, let's and cut talk back about to the slides. Uh, who we mean when we say non-career employee? Yeah. So first, here's what I want you to come away with. Um, first, what we mean when we say non-career employee. Uh, second, which ethics authorities apply specifically or differently to non-career employees than to your career employees? And then finally, and then most importantly, why it is so essential to first answer the question, who is asking for advice? That is a very important question indeed. So first, I want to begin with the question, what do we mean by a non-career employee? When we use the term non-career employee, we're really looking at political appointees. And in this presentation, we're going to look at three specific types. Appointees, as defined in the Ethics Pledge, covered non-career employees, and political appointees to full-time non-career positions. Um, now, it's important to keep in mind that non-career is not synonymous with accepted service. So, for example, if you have an attorney who's brought in under the Schedule A hiring authority, um, this person is not going to be a non-career uh, for these purposes. That's a very good distinction to be aware of because we could accidentally capture a huge universe of people right. that weren't intended by these provisions. That's correct. So when we refer to appointees here, we're looking at the definition of appointee as it is used in the Ethics Pledge, which was issued by President Obama in Executive Order 13490. Essentially, through this executive order, every appointee and every executive agency appointed on or after January 20th of 2009 is required to sign the Ethics Pledge, thus making a commitment to fulfill several obligations. Um, and I'm going to go into the specifics of those obligations later. So the definition of appointee here includes every full-time, non-career presidential or vice presidential appointee, non-career appointee in the senior executive service or other SES type system, and appointee to a position that has been accepted from the competitive service by reason of being of a confidential or policy making character. So Schedule C and other positions accepted under comparable criteria. Um, and again, in executive agencies. Yeah, I think, you know, in some ways this is the hardest part of doing these analyses is, you know, keeping the personnel stuff. Right, straight. figuring out exactly uh, who this applies to. Exactly. Uh, now, who does this not apply to? It does not include any person appointed as a member of the senior foreign server, senior foreign service, or solely as a uniformed service commissioned officer. Now, there are several categories that are entirely excluded from this definition. First, we're excluding special government employees, or SGEs. Um, so as OGE emphasizes in Deogram 09-005, SGEs are not considered to be full-time non-career appointees subject to the pledge requirement. Um, and as you'll see, there are a number of um, you know, very... Uh, uh, very limiting pledge requirements, so these are not going to apply to your SGEs. And that makes sense because our SGEs are, are part-time officials who are serving right. in sort of an expert capacity on a temporary basis providing expertise to the government, and if we subjected them to all of the pledge requirements, many of them would probably decide they'd prefer not provide their expertise to the government. Right. So second, and this should go without saying, career senior executive service employees are excluded. But I want to mention this up front because in a few slides we're going to be talking about certain pay thresholds. And I want to make it very clear that, again, we're only talking about non-career employees, i.e. political appointees. And then finally, those Schedule C employees with no policy-making role that have been excluded from the 278 filing requirement have also been excluded for the purposes of the Ethics Pledge. 
This may include, for example, chauffeurs, schedulers, administrative assistants, etc. OGE makes the determination to exclude a position from the filing requirement when such exclusion would not adversely affect the integrity of the government or the public's confidence in the integrity of the government. So for this reason, the pledge is not intended to reach these individuals either. This assumes, of course, that the agency follows the procedures to properly exclude the position in the first place from the filing requirement. So the second category that we're going to be looking at is the covered non-career employee. And thinking about this group is a little less intuitive because outside of ethics, we really don't think in terms of covered non-career employees. That's, we, that's right. I think this is, a, this is a complicated category on its face. Uh, covered non-career employee, covered by what, and they, right, they don't have right. a career. Uh, so yeah, I think this is this is sometimes confusing. Right, because we're used to hearing terms like Schedule C, non-career SES, PAS, and you get to covered non-careers, and, and it's it's kind of hard to think about them if you're not uh, if you're not using this terminology uh, regularly. Um, so when we say covered non-career, we're really looking at the most senior non-career employees of the agency. So it's helpful to think about the definition in, in two parts, both of which need to be met. So first, we need to be able to mark the pay or seniority box. So to be a covered non-career, the employee must occupy a position classified above GS-15 on the general schedule. Or if the position is not under the general schedule, the rate of basic pay is equal to or greater than 120% of the minimum rate of basic pay payable for GS-15 of the general schedule. Um, additionally, SGEs are specifically excluded from the definition. Um, so that was that was quite a mouthful there. Um, I want to say a, a couple uh, words about pay. First, what do we mean by the rate of basic pay? Yes, we get a lot of questions about this one um, because I, I think it's maybe less than intuitive when we when we get into the actual definition. Right. Um, so the rate of basic pay. Um, so for the purposes of applying this definition to an individual who holds a general schedule or other position that provides several rates of pay or steps per grade, the rate of basic pay is going to be the rate of pay for the lowest step of the grade at which the employee is employed. So for example, if you had a GS-15 step 7, the rate of basic pay would be that of a GS-15 step 1. One way that I find helpful to remember how this uh, this provision works is that it's the rate of basic pay for the position, right? Not to the individual. So the uh, individual can advance in the position and secure a salary far above the rate of basic pay. But what we're concerned about is covered non-career positions, uh, not individuals within the government. So we we look to the the rate of basic pay for the position. Correct. Very good. And then second, you may be wondering, well, how much does an SES make? Would an SES automatically meet that pay threshold? Um, and fortunately, the answer is yes. The SES pay range has a minimum rate of basic pay equal to 120% of the rate for GS-15 Step 1, which is exactly what we need in order to check off this box. Excellent. Well, that's uh, convenient for us. That is very convenient. <laughs> Unless we're an abandoned agency with alternate pay systems, and then we have to yes. get the calculator out. Yes, we would. <laughs> so second, you need to be able to mark the non-career box. So you need you need both halves, uh, the second of which is the non-career box. So to be a covered non-career, you need to be one of the following. Um, either appointed by the president to a position described in the executive schedule, or to a position that by statute or as a matter of practice is filled by presidential appointment. Um, however, positions within the uniformed services and certain foreign service positions are excluded. Um, you could also be a non-career member of the senior executive service or of another SES type, type system such as the senior foreign service. Um, you could be appointed to a Schedule C position or to a position under an agency specific statute that establishes appointment criteria essentially the same as those set forth for Schedule C positions. Um, and then finally, you could be appointed to a non-career executive assignment position or to a position under an agency specific statute that establishes appointment criteria essentially the same as those for non-career executive assignment positions. I think I'll be referring back to this slide a lot yes. in the future. <laughs> yes. uh, because that's one of the difficult parts is there are all these possibilities to get us to non-career 
And mm-hmm. it's just very important that we consider all of those potential categories when figuring out if an employee is subject to these provisions. Correct. Um, so again, you need to be able to mark both boxes um, in order to have a covered non-career employee. Um, so now we're going to do a, a quick exercise. Patrick, will you help me on this? Sure. Okay. So say you have a Schedule C employee who is a GS-15 Step 8. Okay. Is that employee a covered non-career well, let's see. I'm going to start with the first checkbox right. because it's at the top of the screen. Correct. Um, so let's see. So they this GS 15 step eight. What I know about that is that's probably more than 120 percent of, uh, of of GS 15 step one. But we want to look at the rate of basic. pay. We want to look at the rate of basic pay. That's right. We don't want to forget that. Uh, so we would look at that position and uh, the rate of basic pay for the position, mm-hmm. rather than the pay the employee actually takes home would probably be GS 15 step one. Correct. So in that case, we wouldn't be able to tick this first box. Right. So we wouldn't have a non-career, a covered non-career official in this case. Right. So just for the heck of it, let's go on to the second box anyway. So so what about the second box? Would we, would be, yeah, I'm sorry, would we be able to check the second box for this employee? I I don't think so. Uh, You know, we're not going to have someone who's non-career SES. Uh, It's not going to be a presidential appointment. Uh, We don't have any information to suggest it's a Schedule C or similar. Well? Or do we? Or could we? Uh, if you look at the top of your screen, we've got a. Oh, we've got oh we a have schedule a Schedule C. C. We have a Schedule C. Uh, the, the GS 15 Step 8 is a Schedule C. Okay, so we would be able to tick that box, perhaps. We would. Um, so, as Patrick said earlier, we don't have a covered non career, but we do, in this case, have an appointee. Okay, that's that's interesting. So, we, we weren't able to tick the first box, uh, but when we looked at those criteria, we weren't able to tick one or two, but the third, we were. So what do we do in that situation? So we have someone uh, who's an appointee. They're a pledge signer, um, but they wouldn't be a covered non-career. And so uh, in the next few slides, we're going to get into authorities that apply specifically to covered non-careers. Um, those authorities would not apply to this particular individual. That's really interesting. And I think this is where these things get so tricky, is because you can be in certain special categories, but then not qualify for others. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's important to keep those things straight and be uh, methodical, unlike I just was when we're going through these analyses. Okay, so Patrick, you're not off the hook yet. We've got uh, we've got two more. So we have a career SES. Is this a covered non-career? Okay, so we'll start again with the with the first box. Uh, and I think you just mentioned that we had uh, an efficiency that we can use, which is the rate of basic pay for SES positions is set at 120 percent. Right. Uh, so we're going to be able to tick that box. So we're good to go on on the on the the, the rate of basic pay provision. Mm-hmm. So then the next question is, is it an appointee position? Well, they're a career SES, so I don't think we'll be able to uh, to tick that box. That's correct. The so we... second box, uh, they are a member of the SES, mm-hmm. um, but they're not non-career. So they're career SES, so we're not going to be able to tick that either. Right. Uh, doesn't look like they're Schedule C, usually not. Um and their career SES, so that seems like they probably wouldn't fall in the non-career executive assignment position category either. That's right. So career SES is not going to be a covered non-career. Excellent. I'm improving that, Monica. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So third one, we have uh, an employee who is appointed by the president to a position at level two of the executive schedule. Are they a covered non-career? Oh. Let's see. Well, let's start with the top box again. Okay. So they are they're on the executive schedule. And I think you also said before that if we're if we're talking about the executive schedule, we kind of automatically tick this box. Well, right, right. So the executive schedule, the the minimum level of pay is going to exceed even that of the uh, the senior executive service. So you've got the first box checked. So we're good to go there. We're good to go on the first box. Uh, and then appointed by a president to a position described in the executive schedule, uh, 5 USC 5312 through 53. 53- 17. I, th- I think we can we take this box yes, too. Yes, yes we can. So guess what? We finally have we uh, have our covered non-career. A covered official. non-career. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Okay. So the third type of appointee uh, that we're going to talk about is uh, the presidential appointee to a full-time non-career position. Uh, this group includes any employee who is appointed by the president to a full-time position uh, described in 5 USC 5312. 
through 5317 or to a position that by statute or as a matter of practice is filled by presidential appointment. Um, there are certain categories that this does not include. Um, first, a position filled under the authority of 3 U.S.C. 105 or 3 U.S.C. 107A for which the rate of basic pay is less than that for GS9, step one of the general schedule. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, these positions uh, include assistance and services for the president uh, and domestic policy staff for the president. Ah, interesting. Actually, that's a that's a category uh, and a citation that I don't believe I've ever looked uh, yeah, at Yeah, I, I haven't seen uh, this come up for me personally. Yes, so. Um, second, it would not include a position within a White House operating unit that is designated as not normally subject to change as a result of a presidential transition. Um, third, it would not include a position within the uniformed services. Uh, and four, it would not include a position in which a member of the Foreign Service is serving that does not require advice and consent of the Senate. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, wasn't our last covered non-career example a pres uh, about a presidential appointee at level two of the executive schedule? Yes. Yes, that's correct. It was. And you would be right. That's because um, for most ethics officials, I would bet the vast majority of your presidential appointees are also going to be covered non-career employees. Because as I said, your covered non-careers are your most senior non-careers in your agency. And I just want to give a quick note about the terminology that I'll be using throughout this presentation. Um, I'm going to be using the shorthand presidential appointee, uh, but what I mean by this is presidential appointee to a full-time non-career position as defined at 5 CFR 2635.804 C2. Um, you well, can Monica, I can't, I can't understand why you would want to shorten that phrase. No. It just rolls yeah. off the tongue so easily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can, you can see why I'm going to be using the shorthand, but I just want to bring this up now so that I don't create any confusion uh, for our listening audience. And I think this, this also makes the point uh, that it's really important for us to go back to the definitions when we're advising employees. This is not the kind of ethics opinion that you can write from memory. Right. We're going to have to dig into the reg. We're going to have to go look up that uh, definition every time we do this. Exactly. And the important thing is to remember to do that. Yes. Excellent. OK, so how do these three groups fit together? So to give you a visual. Um, I'm so happy we're going to do uh, this. I yes. was so confused. <laughs> and I was like, I hope there's a Venn diagram. Maybe this is a Venn diagram. Why, yes, this is a Venn diagram. <laughs> Excellent. I'm feeling better already. OK. Um, so uh, let's start with your appointees as defined in the ethics pledge. This is going to be your largest group of non-career employees um, and includes the majority of your political appointees. Again, it's not going to include your SGEs, um, your career SAS, your career senior foreign service, um, or uniformed service commissioned officers. Now, a subset of this group is going to be your covered non-career employees. Again, the most senior or highest paid non-careers in your agency. And another subset uh, are your presidential appointees to full-time non-career positions. Now, as I said, this group will largely overlap with your covered non-career group. Um, however, it's not a perfect subset. There may be positions filled by presidential appointment that are not covered non-career positions because you're not able to check the pay box. So it's very important to keep this overlap in mind because some ethics authorities are going to apply differently to presidential appointees, as we'll see in a moment. So if you have a covered non-career who is also a presidential appointee, the more restrictive authority will apply to that individual. And of course, completely separate are your career employees. And while we won't be too concerned with them for this presentation, it's important to be aware of them. Um, and I am going to mention them from time to time. Excellent. I think this, this picture is extremely helpful. If I take nothing else away, I will remember that this diagram exists and I can refer to it when I have these questions in the future. So now that we've established who your non-career employees are, where will you encounter ethics authorities that apply specifically or differently to them? So you're going to find these authorities largely in these four categories, outside activities, entering government, gifts, and post-employment. 
And a word of caution here. Keep in mind that the restrictions in these authorities apply in addition to those found in the criminal conflict of interest statutes and the standards of conduct for employees of the executive branch. Um, so for example, if you get a question on outside activities from a covered non-career employee, you're going to look at the, at the criminal conflict of interest statutes the Emoluments Clause, 18 U.S.C. 219, which prohibits public officials from being or acting as agents of foreign principles. Um, you're also going to make sure that the activity complies with the Hatch Act, the Standards of Conduct, any agency supplemental regulations, and 5 CFR Part 26. 36. So this is an added layer of analysis. Yes. It is not a separate layer of analysis or a separate kind of analysis. We have to consider all the normal stuff right. and then additionally remember that there are these separate restrictions that apply to our covered non-career folks or our non-career employees in general. That's correct. And what I'm going to focus on here are those authorities um, among this group that apply specifically to non-career employees. So 2636 um, and a couple of provisions from the teaching, speaking, and writing regulations. And I'm going to spend the greater part of this next section talking about outside activities. And to begin, I'm going to start with the restrictions on outside earned income. As you will see, there are restrictions that apply to covered non-career employees and to presidential appointees. Um, additionally, most of the authorities that I'm going to discuss in this part of the presentation are found at 5 CFR 2636. <laughs> Now, before we leave the covered, uh, or, I'm sorry, before we leave the career employees behind completely, um, I'm going to mention that there are no OGE restrictions for them limiting the amount of outside earned income that they can that they can receive. Uh, the same goes for appointees who are neither covered non-careers nor presidential appointees. Covered non-careers, however, are restricted. So for 2014, they can earn up to $26,955 in outside earned income, and not a penny more. And that is a, it's a very specific number, and I'll get to why that number is what it is in a moment. Yes, but thank you for doing the math for us. I was afraid <laughs> uh, when I heard about this presentation that we might have to do that in real time, and uh, I'm not sure I'm up for that today. Uh, actually, I did not do the math. I, uh, I got that number from OGE, and I'll tell you where you can find it uh, in a moment. Excellent. Uh, next, uh, finally, our presidential appointees are even further restricted. They can earn outside earned income. That's much easier math. Yes, yeah, that's, that, <laughs> very that, easy. That, that's a number I'm very familiar with. <laughs> so before we address the restrictions on covered non-careers and presidential appointees, I want to give you a definition for outside earned income. This is going to include, with some exclusions, wages, salaries, honoraria, commissions, professional fees, and any other form of comp compensation for services other than salary, benefits, and allowances paid by the U.S. government. And first we're going to start with the limitation for presidential appointees because it's the easiest. As I said, presidential appointees to full-time non-career positions are prohibited from receiving outside earned income. Executive Order 12, uh, 12674 as modified by Executive Order 12731 established this complete ban. And it's important to keep this complete ban in mind as we go through the next few slides. As I said earlier, most if not all of your presidential appointees are also going to be covered non-careers. So if you have a presidential appointee that's also a covered non-career, you're going to follow the stricter requirement. Next is the limitation applicable to covered non-careers, which is found at 2636.304. And if you're familiar with this limitation, you probably know it as the 15% limitation. So that's how I'm introducing it. So you may be wondering, well, 15% of what? Yeah. And it is not 15% of the employee's salary. rate of basic pay for level two of the executive schedule under, uh, under 5 U.S.C. 5313 as in effect on January 1st of such calendar year. But not to worry, when that dollar amount changes, OGE will issue a legal advisory with a new dollar figure. So that's where I got my uh, dollar figure from the previous slide. Um, in fact, the, uh, the last legal advisory issued on this subject was LA14-01, which came out on January 3rd of this year. That's excellent, because uh, I've looked at this provision before in, 26, uh, in 2636, and 
it, it causes some concern. Yes. I, so, well, now I have to go figure out when this is, and was that in place on January 1st, or mm -hmm. is that changed since then? Level 2 of the executive uh, schedule. Right. Uh, it's, it's nice to know that OGE provides us an opinion at the beginning of the year, so uh, we don't have to go through that uh, that exercise. Right. Now, there are a couple of other points that I briefly want to touch on here. First, this provision limits the income that's attributable to the calendar year, regardless of when it's paid. We want to look at when the services are provided. Second, what happens when the individual becomes a covered non-career in the middle of the year? Uh, there's another calculation that you need to perform, and I'm not going to go into it here, um, but it, it's explained very well at 2636.304. Next, I'm going to discuss two restrictions relating to professions involving fiduciary relationships, and these are found at 2636.305. So the first of these prohibits covered non-career employees from receiving compensation for practicing a profession which involves a fiduciary relationship or affiliating with or being employed to perform professional duties by a firm, partnership, association, corporation, or other entity which provides professional services involving a fiduciary, fiduciary relationship. And there's going to be a very handy chart uh, that I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of slides uh, because, again, that's a lot of information there. And remember, if you're dealing with a presidential appointee, that individual is subject to a complete ban on outside earned income. So if you have a presidential appointee who's also a covered non-career, you're going to get the same result under both authorities. So how do you know if your covered non-career's proposed activity is restricted here? First, you want to ask whether the employee is practicing a profession. In short, a profession is a calling requiring specialized knowledge and often long and intensive preparation. But again, you're going to look at the full definition when you need to refer uh, to it in this section. So if the answer to this question is yes, you're going to ask whether the profession involves a fiduciary relationship. And here, this means a profession in which the nature of the services provided causes the recipient of those services to place a substantial degree of trust and confidence in the integrity, fidelity, and specialized knowledge of the practitioner. Such, profession, uh, such professions include practitioners in areas such as law, insurance, medicine, architecture, financial services, and accounting. Um, so it's safe to say that not all of these are completely intuitive, uh, particularly architecture always kind of surprises me when I see that in this list. Yes, but there's a great deal of, of trust involved in uh, asking a person to design a building that you may later inhabit. That is, that is completely correct. So then if the answer to this question is yes, the covered non-career cannot receive compensation. But keep in mind that this does not prohibit uncompensated service. So for example, this regulation itself would not prohibit a covered non-career who is a practicing attorney from providing free legal services through a pro bono program. But then what if the answer to the first question is no? In that case, you want to ask, is the employee affiliating with or being employed to perform professional duties by an entity? If the answer to this question is yes, ask, does that entity provide services involving a fiduciary relationship? And then if the answer to this question is yes, the covered non-career cannot receive compensation. The second restriction found in 2636.305 applies to the use of one's name. A covered non-career shall not permit his name to be used by any firm, partnership, association, corporation, or other entity which provides professional services involving a fiduciary relationship. So how does this work in practice? For example, suppose you have an accountant, Mr. Charles Debit, who is a founding partner of the firm Debit Jones & Waters. Charles Debit is offered a covered non-career appointment. Should he accept, he must not only uh, terminate his partnership, but the firm would be required to delete his name. 
Okay, now we're going to change this hypothetical a little bit. Now, suppose that Charles's deceased father, Mr. John Debit. Ah, it's the family business. Yes. yes. Uh, a long line of Debits. Yes. <laughs> so Mr. John Debit was the founding partner uh, for whom the firm was named. Uh, now, suppose that we have Charles. Uh, he's the one being offered the covered non-career employment. Um, suppose that he merely worked for the firm. In that case, the name Debit would not need to be deleted from the firm's name. Because we have another debit. Right, right. Uh, the firm wasn't named for Charles. It was named for John. That's correct. Excellent. Okay, that makes sense to me. So, however, uh, Charles Debit's name may not appear on the firm's letterhead after he enters duty as the covered non-career employee. That, that's, a, that's probably a, a less costly fix for the firm than changing the sign and right, right. a new building and all of those things. Right. Excellent. Now, I want to point out that this restriction pertains to covered non-career. So keep in mind that if you have a presidential appointee, you're going to want to check to see uh, whether he or she is also a covered non-career. Um, and if so, the presidential, will, the presidential appointee is going to be subject to this restriction as well. Now, remember at the beginning of my presentation when I was talking about the non-career SES who sought advice um, about serving on the board of a for-profit? Um, and in, in, in that question as well was the question, well, can, can I serve for compensation on the board of the for-profit? Well, here is where I found my answer, which couldn't have been more clear. So under 2636.306, a covered non-career employee shall not receive compensation for serving as an officer or member of the board of any association, corporation, or other entity. Nothing in this section prohibits uncompensated service with any entity. So the answer to my question was no. Compensation was not, prohibit was not permitted in this case. However, if a covered non-career wants to become an uncompensated board member, um, for example, suppose you have a local nonprofit that promotes literacy, um, this regulation in itself would not prohibit the uncompensated board service. And again, one thing to keep in mind is that this restriction is not limited to for-profit entities, but also includes non-profit entities such as charitable organizations and professional uh, associations, as well as any unit or s of state or local government um, when compensation of is involved again. Now, our presidential appointees, they are, of course, subject to a complete ban on outside earned income. I'm sensing a theme here. Yes, yes. <laughs> so regardless of whether they're also covered non-careers, uh, the result is the same. A presidential appointee cannot receive compensation for serving as an officer or a member of a board or for any other outside activity. The next two restrictions we're going to look at together because they both relate to teaching, speaking, and writing. And before we jump into the portions that apply specifically to non-career employees, we're going to have to take a couple of steps back. In fact, let's start at the beginning. Uh, the general rule is that except as permitted, an employee, including a special government employee, shall not receive compensation from any source other than the government for teaching, speaking, or writing that relates to the employee's official duties. And there are two concepts here that are particularly important. I would add, I would oh. add complicated to those yes. to, to important in, in these cases. I find this, even in the simplest of cases, to be sometimes a little bit confusing. And mm -hmm. I, I think the, the two concepts that you've highlighted here, mm -hmm. it's really important to remember that those are rather complex uh, mm -hmm. concepts, regardless of the fact that they seem fairly straightforward. Uh, and, and because of technical difficulties, the, uh, the correct words were not underlined, so I'm taking the underlining out for a moment. But those uh, two concepts are compensation uh, and relating to the employee's official duties. And we do have those definitions in the regulation, which are important to remember, but I think that's where the complexity comes in, is that those are uh, maybe other than intuitive in their scope. Right. So for employees that are not covered non-career, so your general employee population, compensation includes any form of consideration, 
remuneration or income, including royalties, given for or in connection with the employee's teaching, speaking, or writing activities, um, unless accepted under specific statutory authority or an agency gift acceptance statute, it includes transportation, lodgings, and meals, whether provided in kind by purchase of a ticket, by payment in, or, by payment in advance, or by reimbursement after the expense has been incurred. Uh, it does not include a number of things, um, and I'm going to draw your attention to this last point, travel expenses consisting of transportation, lodgings, or meals, including in connection with the teaching, speaking, or writing activity. So let me get this straight. So yeah, we've, yes. In the general definition, explicitly included transportation costs. And then we turn around, and for uh, not covered non-career employees, we go ahead and exclude it explicitly from the definition. That's correct. And I had the hardest time with this, and I said, OGE, what are you guys doing? Why would you construct your regulation this way? Mm -hmm. And it's actually because there was some case law around this, and this was a necessary change to the regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're, 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 we're not crazy here. This was, right. <laughs> <laughs> this was a change that was, that was mandated by some events. Um, so keep in mind that the slide that you're looking at now applies to employees who are not covered non-careers, if you're looking uh, at your covered uh, non-career employees, you're going to lose that last point as an exception. Yeah, and that's an important thing to remember. Yeah. So basically, our uh, our covered non-career folks, uh, the travel expenses are included in the definition of com compensation for those folks. Our regular employees, uh, it's excluded explicitly. Right. Yeah. Okay. The next restriction, which is found at 2636.307, applies specifically to teaching. Uh, that is, a covered non-career employee may receive compensation for teaching only when specifically authorized in advance by the, by the designated agency ethics official. And it's important to remember that for the purposes of, uh, of this provision, teaching has a specific definition, um, which is not going to be limited to teaching in a formal classroom setting. Additionally, 2636.307 sets out specific criteria that DAOs must follow when determining whether to authorize the activity. And even if the covered non-career employee does receive authorization, he or she is still subject to the 15% earned income uh, limitation. Now moving on to our presidential appointees, and this should sound very familiar by now. Uh, presidential appointees may not receive any outside earned income, so they cannot be authorized to teach for compensation. The other concept under teaching, speaking, and writing that I wanted to address is related to official duties, because this too is going to be defined slightly differently for your covered non-careers. Yeah, these nuances I think are important to keep in mind and remember, because yeah. they, they're not always, when you're wading through this section of the standards, uh, they, they don't jump out. You sort of have right. to look at them. Yeah, and it's it's important to remember that they're there. You might not be able to remember them, just... Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, that but... If you remember, there's something strange about these two definitions for our non-career folks. You're doing pretty well. Right. Um, so first, this slide again is going to be for your general... Uh, uh, group of employees, so this is other than your covered non-careers. Um, and the part of the definition that I want to focus on is the last part. So in other words, when the subject of the activity is such that the teaching, speaking, or writing relates to the employee's official duties. Uh, for those who are not covered non-careers and also not SGEs, the teaching, speaking, or writing relates to the employee's official duties if the subject of the activity deals in significant part with one of two things. First, any matter to which the employee presently is assigned or to which the employee had been assigned during the previous one-year period. Uh, or second, any ongoing or announced policy, program, or operation of the agency. However, for your covered non-careers, the teaching, speaking, or writing will also relate to the employee's official duties if the subject of the activity deals in significant part with the general subject matter area, industry, or economic sector primarily affected by the programs and operations of his or her agency. And while that's just a few words, that's a very yeah. large um, change to this definition. That expands the scope of the prohibition extensively 
Right. So you could have two employees side by side. So, for example, suppose you had a program analyst, like a, a career employee yes. at the Environmental Protection Agency who would like to write a book about the history of the environmental movement in the U.S. She would be permitted to receive compensation for writing the book. However, if you had a covered non-career um, who wanted to write a book on the exact same topic, um, she would not be permitted to receive compensation for writing that book on the environmental movement uh, in the U.S. And that's because the subject of the book deals with the general subject matter area primarily affected by the programs and operations of the EPA. And that's a, that's a big difference. That's a major right, change. Right. So it would relate to the covered non-careers official duties, whereas it would not relate to the program analyst's official duties. Um, and again, remember that the general rule is that except is permitted, an employee shall not receive compensation from any source other than the government for teaching, speaking, or writing that relates to the employee's official duties. So now that we've concluded the section on outside activities, uh, with 15 minutes to spare, um, that was, about, that was pretty impressive, actually. That's uh, yeah. a lot of information in just a very few minutes. Right. But a lot of really good information uh, that I, I think our, our viewers will be able to incorporate very mm -hmm. easily in, into their, their, uh, their advice to their employees. And I'm bringing up this slide again because I want to show you um, how appointees uh, fit into the picture. Because we spent so much time focused on covered non-careers, and presidential appointees that we kind of, for the moment, uh, ignored the appointees the, uh, the to a certain the, the mere appointees, the people who are in the green zone in this right. picture. Yes. Okay. Um, so now what we're going to look at is how the ethics pledge applies to this larger appointee group. Um, and because there's so much content here, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm just going to provide an overview of each of the restrictions that applies to this, uh, to this appointee group um, so that you can be aware of the issue when it comes up. However, I'm also at the same time going to provide you with citations for advisories that OGE, OGE has issued um, that contain further information on each of the specific topics. Um, because again, there is a lot of information here uh, and we just have such a, a brief amount of time. And I, I think that's okay because when we're talking about these complex uh, relationships between kinds of appointees, covered non-career versus presidential appointee versus both, mm -hmm. you're always kind of in for a research assignment. Yes. And what you've provided here today and are continuing to provide, which is like excellent, is sort of a research guide. It's uh, mm -hmm. the the cliff's notes for yes. get, getting yes. through this analysis. Excellent. So as I mentioned earlier, Executive Order 13490 requires that every appointee in every executive agency appointed on or after January 20th, 2009, sign the Ethics Pledge, thus making a commitment to fulfill several obligations. So two of these commitments pertain to appointees entering government. The first of these, uh, which is found at paragraph two, applies to all appointees. It prevents them for a period of two years from the date of appointment from participating in any particular matter involving specific parties that is directly and substantially related to their former employer, employer or former clients, including regulations and contracts. The second of these, which is found in paragraph three, applies to appointees who were registered lobbyists within the two years before the date of appointment. These individuals are prohibited for a period of two years after appointment uh, from doing three things. First, participating in any particular matter on which the appointee lobbied within the two years before the date of appointment. A second, participating in the specific issue area in which that particular matter falls. Or three, seeking or accepting employment with any executive agency that the appointee lobbied within the two years before the date of appointment. So there's there's a lot uh, in in these two restrictions, and for additional information, um, well, first on who must sign the ethics pledge, you want to go to Deogram 09-003, 09-005, 09-006, and 09-007. Um, additional information on paragraphs two and three is available at Deogram 09-011 and Deogram 09-020. That's, that's great advice, Monica, and actually these, uh, these opinions I find to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I find the complexity of the pledge is such that I consult them virtually every time I have a mm -hmm. pledge question. So I have these printed out, I keep them in a folder that says ethics pledge, so that when these issues come 
up, I have a place to quickly reference those. Because these concepts, while they are familiar to us, uh, and, and the concepts have something in common with those provisions that apply to uh, regular career officials, there are some nuances that are important to grasp. Right. So next is gifts from outside sources. Uh, paragraph one of the ethics pledge is the lobbyist gift ban, and it applies to all of your appointees who are required to sign the ethics pledge. This prohibits appointees from accepting gifts from registered lobbyists or lobbying organizations for the duration of service as an appointee. And the lobbyist gift ban here operates in addition to the existing OGE gift rules at 2635 subpart B. Very important to remember. Right. So here's how the lobbyist gift ban works. So as you know, employees are prohibited under the standards of conduct from soliciting or accepting gifts from prohibited sources or given because of their official positions. There are some items that are entirely excluded from the definition of gift, and there are other items that are gift exceptions. An item that falls within an exception is still a gift, but it may be accepted by the employee. So what the lobbyist gift ban does is remove the availability of certain gift exceptions if you're dealing with an appointee who has signed the ethics pledge and the potential donor is a registered lobbyist or lobbying organization. And I think it's important that there are two criteria we're looking at here. The mm -hmm. gift has to be from a lobbyist or a lobbying organization mm -hmm. and it has to be to someone who is subject to this provision. Right. And if both of those apply then we need to be very careful because certain exceptions aren't going to be available to us. Right. And this slide provides an overview of the exceptions that are available and those that are not available. Um, again, as Patrick said, if you're dealing with a pledge signer and the donor is a registered lobbyist or lobbying organization, um, if you're dealing with a career employee, uh, all of the gift exceptions are still available. And for more information on the lobbyist gift ban, I would strongly encourage you that addresses this topic in depth, and this is one that I refer to quite often. The Ethics Pledge also creates two additional post-employment restrictions for appointees. These are going to be found at paragraphs 4 and 5 of the Pledge. Paragraph 4 applies to appointees who are also senior employees, as defined at 18 U.S.C. 207C. So under 207C, senior employees are prohibited from making certain communications or appearances before their agency on behalf of another within one year of terminating service as a senior employee. What paragraph 4 does is extend that cooling off period to two years following the end of the senior employee's appointment. Paragraph 5 prohibits uh, lobbying certain officials for the remainder of the administration. And it's important to remember that, again, these post-employment restrictions operate in addition to the restrictions uh, that are already found at 18 U.S.C. Section 207. And for more information on paragraphs 4 and 5, I would encourage you to read Deogram 10-004, uh, FAQs on post-employment under the Ethics Pledge. So as we have seen, there are several ethics authorities that apply specifically or differently to non-career appointees. Um, so whenever you receive an ethics question that could implicate one of these authorities, it is vital to know who is asking the question, uh, whether that person is an appointee, and in many cases also whether that employee is a covered non-career uh, or a presidential appointee. Well, Monica, thank you very much for joining us and uh, serving as our guide through this universe of laws and regulations that apply to our appointees and our, our covered non-career officials. I know this is an area with a great deal of complexity, and it's very difficult to cover that in, uh, in comprehensively in an hour, but you've provided us an excellent guide to navigating this 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 field of authorities uh, when we're when we're advising other than career officials so uh, thanks very much for joining us on our last virtual only broadcast of the forum I hope our viewers have found this very helpful and I hope they will also join us for forum day three the final day of the national government ethics summit uh, so thank you all very much for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow <laughs>